Welcome to Subject to Power. I'm El Kamihiro. Before we get started with the episode, I wanted to ask all of you to help me with something. One of my favorite things about this podcast is our incredibly diverse listenership. We've got listeners from dozens of countries around the world, and we're trying to reach more people in all of those places. The absolute most helpful thing that you can do to support my work and Subject to Power is to leave a great review expressing what you like about the show and give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcast or any of the other apps, or even on the website subjecttopower.com. Reviews and ratings really help people find us. Thank you so much for listening and for all of your engagement. I love making this podcast for you. And on to the show. We throw the term patriarchy around. Um, It's the patriarchy's fault. It's the patriarchy this and the patriarchy that. We're smashing the patriarchy. To the point that it has become almost an abstract concept that may not feel so related to real-life events. But I like to think of patriarchy as a living, breathing, constantly evolving strategy that finds its expression at all levels of society, socially, economically, politically. In different parts of the world, it looks different, but the organizing principles are the same. To preserve male domination and to control women, and through women, of course, most importantly, reproduction. In some parts of the world, it is disguised and covert. In other cultures, it is outspoken and overt. My guest on today's episode, scholar, journalist, and author Lita Hong Fincher, has spent many years studying and writing about how women in China are finding themselves on the receiving end of both old and new novel patriarchal strategies in their country, but also about how women in today's China are resisting and fighting against domination and for equality, both in the private sphere and the public arena. Here is our conversation. Congratulations on your 10th anniversary of Leftover Women, and thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time. And I wanted to kind of give listeners an idea of like how you came to this subject. And you're a journalist, but there's more to it than that. So if you can just like introduce a little bit about your work. Sure. Well, I was a longtime journalist in China doing TV and radio mostly. The last position that I held as a journalist in China was as Beijing correspondent for Voice of America. And then I was working in Washington, D.C., and I had two little children. And we, as a family, decided to move back to China. And Voice of America sponsored me for a second tour as Beijing correspondent. So you have to apply to the Chinese foreign ministry for a journalist visa in order to report legally in the country. So my husband was also a journalist, and he got his journalist visa approved in 2009. And so we thought, okay, well, let's move back on your visa, and mine will come through pretty soon after that. But we relocated, moving with our two young children back to Beijing in the summer of 2009. But I waited for nine months and I still didn't get my journalist visa approved by China's foreign ministry. So we had already relocated and our children were in preschool and I was not able to work legally in the country. So at that point, I applied for PhD programs in sociology. Um, It was actually something that my mother suggested. She's a longtime China scholar. I mean, I really didn't know what would come of it. I just thought, okay, well, I have to do something. (laughs) Otherwise, I'm not able to work here legally. So I was then a PhD candidate in the sociology program at Tsinghua University. And I was enrolled in these classes. And one of the classes I took was the sociology of work. And for that seminar, I was doing a mini ethnography of real estate agents. 
And I started just hanging around these real estate agencies and interviewing real estate agents. And that was when I started to notice the very gendered patterns of home buying in Beijing. And I started doing more interviews with young women who were purchasing real estate. And I noticed that a lot of these young women would transfer their life savings over to their boyfriend or fiance to purchase a marital home that was solely registered in a man's name. And at first, I was just incredibly shocked. I thought, well, that seems like a really foolish thing to do, but it's probably not typical. But the more interviews I did, the more I realized, wow, this is something that's really common. And it's very intelligent, well-educated women are just transferring all of their money over to their fiancés or boyfriends to buy housing. And the women don't own the housing. And so I just kept probing more deeply and I started asking more questions. And that's when the first of my female interviewees told me, well, I am almost a leftover woman. I'm almost a shengnu, just defined as being 27 years old and single. And so I'm running out of time. So I have to make these compromises. So that's sort of how I got onto this whole topic and that later became this book, Leftover Women. Yeah. And I want to dig into all of what you found and what you're reporting on, but I wanted to start a little bit at the beginning about the whole concept of leftover women and how it arose in Chinese culture. Sure. If you look at the history of gender in communist China, Gender equality was really a rallying cry for the Chinese communist revolutionaries, even before the founding of the People's Republic in 1949. And these young communists, especially in the 1920s, they used the liberation of women as a way to recruit women to join the revolution, because a lot of these women were very tightly controlled by their families. They were bound by arranged marriages. There was polygamy everywhere. A lot of the women were not educated at all or were illiterate, in fact. And so this was a very powerful way to get women to join the revolution. And then after the founding of the People's Republic in 1949, Mao Zedong, who was the founder of China, perhaps his most famous saying ever, was women hold up half the sky. So with the founding of this new communist nation, gender equality was written into the new constitution and the new communist government implemented all of these policies based on this principle of gender equality. One of the most important things they did was rewrite the marriage law. And this new marriage law said that polygamy was outlawed and that women had the right to get a divorce if they wanted to. And women also had the right to own property. That became kind of complicated because the communists basically obliterated the idea of private property later. But in principle, it was this new law that proclaimed women's legal rights. And also the communist government espoused full employment for women in China. So that meant that all across the country, in cities, women were assigned jobs alongside men. And in the countryside, women were all expected to go out and work the fields alongside men. So there was extremely high female labor force participation, probably the highest in the world. So what happened when China began to introduce market reforms at the end of the 1970s is that alongside these market reforms and the undoing of the planned economy, a lot of those policies of gender equality were eroded or completely undone very quickly. So for example, when the government began to dismantle these massive state-owned enterprises, that meant that millions and millions of workers were thrown out of work. 
but women bore the brunt of those layoffs. So women were the first to be laid off starting in the 1980s. And gradually you saw the re-emergence of these very traditional patriarchal beliefs about women. And then over time, especially starting in the 1990s, female labor force participation rates began to fall significantly. And you started to see a rise in economic gender inequality of many different kinds. And this is something that I write a lot about in the book, Leftover Women. It actually reminds me of the efforts of the U.S. government to put women back in the home after they had joined the labor force during World War II. Yes, absolutely. That That is exactly what, that is a very similar dynamic. So part of the resurgence of gender inequality was that the government began to see the education and accomplishments of women as a threat rather than something that was to be celebrated. As China emerged from the early communist era and it got over the Cultural Revolution, women's education started to improve. And then it gradually improved significantly so that by the early 2000s, there were just as many women in college as men. And in fact, women started to overtake men at the college level and even at the master's degree level. And this change in educational achievement among women had taken place in just one generation, really. So it was extremely rapid. So when I started doing all of my interviews at the end of 2010, actually, um, and I noticed that women were saying, well, I'm, I'm a leftover woman. So I thought, okay, I had never heard that term before. But I started looking into the term and I realized this is not some free-floating new slang word. This is actually a weaponized term created and pushed, aggressively pushed by the Chinese government in an aggressive and very sexist propaganda campaign that officially designated women who were educated and professional, who were 27 years old and single, those women were called leftover women or shengnu. And there was this incredibly broad propaganda campaign Nobody saw it as propaganda until I started saying, this is propaganda. (laughs) So I started writing op-eds about how I believed that that's what was going on. And why was this happening? Well, I did more research. And I realized that just before this propaganda campaign started in 2007, there was a big Chinese state council, which is like their cabinet, a big announcement from the government saying that China has a severe problem with, quote unquote, the low quality of the population in China, and that China urgently needed to, quote unquote, upgrade population quality. And how would it do that? It said it was going to designate these different agencies and put them in charge of upgrading population quality. That things like the sex ratio imbalance, where there were millions more men than women as a result of, of course, the government didn't say this, but the reason there were millions more men than women is because, largely because of the draconian population policy known as the one-child policy. So there was, for more than three decades, there were these really horrible human rights abuses, abuses of women where there were forced abortions, there was widespread female infanticide, mass forced insertion of IUDs, all of these things to adhere to the so-called one-child policy. And sex-selective abortions as well began to increase. Into the 2000s, there was this really large sex ratio imbalance that the government called a threat to social stability. So I just put those two developments together and I I made the argument that this propaganda campaign stigmatizing single educated women 
scaring them into believing that they need to hurry up and get married and make all these compromises in marriage, that that was related to this government drive to upgrade population quality. Because when you look at the propaganda, all of the sexist propaganda is targeting educated single women. And a lot of the images showed women wearing a mortarboard on their head, which is the the kind of hat that you wear when you graduate. So so they're clearly targeting college-educated women or women with an even higher education than college and trying to get these women to lower their standards when they get married and to hurry up and get married. So that's essentially what, what it is. And what's so ironic is that leftover women suggest that there's a surplus of women, whereas in reality, there's actually a surplus of men. And that's what they're addressing with the sort of aggressive campaign for women to find male mates. Yes, exactly. And so, I mean, a lot of people ask me when I'm talking about my book, well, why didn't the government do the same kind of propaganda campaign for men. Well, it's because of the sexism. Because men, by and large, are the ones who really want to get married. It's the women who are choosing, educated women in particular, who are choosing to delay or reject marriage altogether. There's not going to be any use in the government telling men, hey, men, you need to get married. (laughs) Because the men generally want to get married. So it's very striking. It's incredibly misogynistic propaganda. I mean, I have a lot of examples of just how egregiously sexist the propaganda is. And it's clearly trying to get the educated women, who, by the way, are also considered by the government to be of quote unquote high quality in terms of, you know, their genetic makeup and their breeding and their education. These are the women that the government wants to be having children. And that also speaks to the government's view that marriage is politically stabilizing. So you can't just go and have a baby um, in China. Well, you can. But if you're not married and you have a baby, you're going to be hit with all sorts of penalties effectively. And so that deters the vast majority of single women from having babies if they want one. The correct way to do it, according to the government, is you have to get married and it has to be a heterosexual marriage and then they want you to have a baby. And now it's no longer a one-child policy in China because of rapidly falling marriage and birth rates The government has undone the one-child policy. It tried to introduce a two-child policy back at the end of 2015. That failed to result in this bump in birth rates that was hoped for by the government. And in 2021, the government introduced a three-child policy. So if you look at the propaganda today in China, it's all urging young people to marry and have three children, which is a dramatic turnaround in a very short period of time. Very dramatic. And it is surprising how we don't, as women, I think, kind of like see through the schemas that are leveled against us in as far as that is concerned. You know, the sort of really blatant economic motivations behind patriotic states that I see parallels with the U.S. and the whole suburbanization and the commercial campaigns to get women to care about household appliances and household everything to motivate them to care about the domestic sphere more than anything else. I mean, patriarchy is global (laughs) and really universal, sadly. And so these patriarchal forces are appear in different forms all around the world. And you certainly see a lot of that in America, which is very frightening. I mean, we're going through a period of enormous regression and a huge assault on women's rights 
and the rights of LGBTQ people in America, I mean, and reproductive rights. So, yeah, there are those kinds of similarities. The thing about China that is really unique is, I mean, there are other autocratic states, but this is really by far the largest, most powerful autocratic state in the world. And the level of state surveillance and penetration of a state into the individual's private life is truly not entirely unparalleled. I mean, I suppose if you look at North Korea, there's that level of totalitarian and a total penetration of individuals' lives. But it is very frightening, the degree to which whatever the government wants to do then becomes and dictates to a large extent, your life as an individual, because there isn't press freedom. So you don't have a choice really about what kind of news you get at all. It's all censored. There's no internet freedom. The internet is very heavily censored and surveilled. It's not a democracy. You don't get to choose your leaders. So like America, yes, of course, there's extensive brainwashing <laughs> happening in this country, but you do have sources of information. It's a democracy. You can go and vote for your leaders. But in China, you can't do that. You can't protest freely. It's extremely dangerous to take part in any kind of social movement. You could risk being jailed for many, many years. It just means that because the Communist Party in China the leaders have decided for a long time, actually, that they need to really do more to subjugate women and to have more of a state-sponsored backlash, really, against women's achievements of the early communist era, that that's a really totalizing sort of effect that, you know, that is really unique in the world. I find it so heartbreaking that, you know, you have this whole generation of high achieving women who are having their self-confidence or confidence just undermined. Now, all of a sudden, now it doesn't matter. Those achievements don't matter. It doesn't get you what you thought it was going to get you because what really matters is marriage and procreating. Yes. So I have to say one thing that is very heartening, though, um, I just came out with this new, fully revised 10th anniversary edition of Leftover Women. And one thing, there's a lot of very bad news about women's rights in China over the past decade. But one thing that is really heartening is that the young women today in China are no longer so fooled by state propaganda. So it's become quite mainstream, in fact, and widely accepted for young women to say that they want to stay single. And that really gives me hope for the future, especially women who've gone to college in China, because those women still have a lot of space to determine what they do with their own lives. So if they're able to resist the very intense pressure to get married and have babies, which increasingly what young women are doing, then they can preserve a high degree of freedom in their lives. If they're able to avoid what has become, very sadly, has become a real trap, the trap of marriage in China is... That's a really disturbing development over the last decade. It's become a lot more difficult to get divorced. So today, unfortunately for women who are already married in China, it's exceedingly difficult to get out of that marriage if the spouse doesn't agree. I mean, if your spouse agrees to divorce, then okay, fine. But in so many cases, and it's primarily the woman who wants to get out of, in many cases, it's an abusive marriage. Um, and this is something that I write about as well in my book is this epidemic of intimate partner violence. And there's almost nothing you can do about it. And it's extremely disturbing in China. But if you're not married, you can just say no 
and resist that marriage pressure. But of course, it's a very difficult thing to do. But that is, in fact, what millions and millions of young women are doing today. And that is a big driver of falling birth and marriage rates. I do want to circle back to the original discussion about the role of real estate, because I think it's just such a big piece of all of this. And I would love for my listeners to sort of understand when you say trap, that figures into it. Yes. I mean, it may sound extreme to say that marriage is a trap in China, but this is what a lot of women have told me. A lot of women that I've interviewed, they use that word, trap. And one of the ways in which it is a real trap is financially, because this goes with China's privatization of housing, because under communism, basically property became entirely state owned. So there was no such thing effectively as private property for a long time after the People's Republic was founded in In 1949, there wasn't a market. It was communism, a planned economy. You were assigned a job by the state and you were assigned housing. You didn't have to really pay for it. So then as part of um, economic reforms that really took off in the 1990s in particular in China, that's when you started to see these double digit economic growth rates and people started calling China, you know, this economic miracle. Alongside that supposed economic miracle was this incredible real estate market that was just being born out of nowhere. All of these previously free state allocated apartments were transferred into private housing. And there were all these different kinds of incentives for people to get into this new nascent real estate market. And it became this over time, it became this inflated real estate bubble, but with massive transfers and accumulation of wealth in the form of this new residential real estate that was and still is today the most valuable asset for anybody, for your average person in China. That's your most important form of wealth is where you live because it's worth so much money especially when you look at how expensive housing is in China compared to the average income of a person, a consumer in China. So when you look at price to income ratios, what they call it, but effectively it means you earn a lot less money in a Chinese city than as an American in, say, New York City. Where in New York City, you know, apartments are really expensive. They're unaffordable. (laughs) But they're so much more unaffordable in Chinese cities like Beijing and Shanghai because the average Chinese person earns a lot less money than the average American. So what you're looking at is this vast market of completely unaffordable housing. And yet people are buying this housing. And The housing is almost all registered in men's names. And that was another thing that was carried over from the patriarchal history in China, where the man was always seen as the head of the household. Even in the early communist era, this was still a common practice, especially in the countryside. The man was viewed as the head of the household. So you have these really old beliefs about gender, And then this new phenomenon of this red hot real estate market where everybody was being pressured into buying these unaffordable homes. So how do people buy them? You basically pool family assets. And that means as a young person, you can't afford to buy a home. So how is it that all these young men own homes? It's because their families, their parents, and other relatives in many cases come together, they pool all all of their money and the money becomes channeled towards men in the family. And sometimes the men are actually little boys. As soon as couples had a boy, in many cases, they would start saving money to buy a home for that boy. But if it's a girl, I found in my research that there was still enormous gender discrimination against daughters by parents. 
when it came to the purchasing of housing. So parents would assume that their daughter didn't need their help in buying a home because she was female and they thought it was the obligation of the man to provide a home. But then when you look at the parents of men, you know, they often didn't have enough money to buy a home for their son or their nephew. But these women, because they're so accomplished and so well-educated in many cases, they're making a lot of money on their own. And that's how you have this bizarre, incredibly unequal phenomenon of highly educated, accomplished women often making a really good income. But then when they get married, they were often just transferring their financial assets over to a man to buy a home. The home would be registered solely in the man's name in many cases. And so then you'd have just this huge transfer of wealth as well from young women over to men. And women were really shut out of this enormous accumulation of residential real estate wealth in many different ways. It's quite complicated, but there are so many different forces that combine to produce profound gendered oppression and shut women out of property rights, out of the accumulation of wealth. There are things like real estate regulations that restrict um, the purchasing of property if you're a single person, and that ends up hurting women more than men. Because marriage is very closely connected to the purchasing of housing in China, um, it was really important, I thought, to look at both. The purchasing of housing connected with getting married and how women were hurt and discriminated against. By all of these factors, including pressure from their own parents to get married, um, all sorts of things. The picture I'm getting is that men are sort of socially pressured as almost like a masculine tradition towards home ownership in order to attract a mate. And then women are pressured to not own a home and to find a man who does. Yes, that's <laughs> basically the underlying dynamic. But the thing is, there are a lot of, in fact, academics, I think, who misunderstand the phenomenon. And, and they there are economists who've written about this, arguing that, oh, well, because of this norm of male home ownership in China, that means all these women are getting free housing when they get married. No, that is not the way it works. It's much more complicated than that. What ends up happening is that Yes, most property is in men's names, but a lot of that property, a lot of the housing is actually financed by women. Just because the home is, you know, ends up being owned by the man doesn't mean the woman didn't have a role in purchasing it. And so what I found in my research was so many times the woman getting married was actually the primary person or at least a major person contributing financially to the purchasing of a home, but then she wasn't benefiting it. She didn't own the home in the end. And even when it came to jointly owned properties, the legal system discriminates against women so that in 2011, this marriage law that was really gender equal when it was first passed in 1950, that marriage law was changed in 2011 to say that in the event of a divorce, whoever bought the home, the marital home, keeps the home. But that's way too simple because women usually contribute financially to the purchasing of the home. But then if their name's not on the deed, they don't get to keep it. And even there's been a lot more research in the last decade showing, unfortunately, that if you're getting a divorce as a woman the judge is almost always going to rule against you. Even if your name is on the deed jointly, the only way you can keep that marital property as a woman getting divorced is if the property is solely registered in your name. 
And by the way, that's not even going to happen. If you're the victim of abuse by your husband, first of all, it's going to be really hard for you to get a divorce anyway, because it's sadly, this is one of the new developments is it's so difficult to get a divorce as a woman. If you're trying to escape an abusive marriage and that home is registered in your name as a woman, well, you know, too bad. If you want to leave, you want to escape the abuse, you need to escape that home. You lose out on the value of the property and you often lose custody of your own children too. Mm. So many things occur to me about the unfairness of this to women just categorically. It doesn't just disadvantage them in the present, but also I'm thinking, you know, generational wealth that's a stream that kind of like then ends. Well, yes. So that's another thing that I get into in my book is just a discussion of how the market reforms in China were not evenly distributed. (laughs) They primarily benefited men. I mean, there were definitely men who lost out too, especially rural, uneducated men. But I mean, anybody in the countryside lost out. But there is an enormous amount of gender inequality that happened, that women did not benefit anywhere near as much as men did from these breakneck economic growth rates. And also this incredible inequality in wealth that has happened over the last few decades in China, truly staggering rates of wealth inequality. It's truly extreme because there's nothing like a property tax. There's nothing like a wealth tax or an inheritance tax In America, we have these, you know, estate taxes, inheritance taxes. You don't have that in China. But so you just have this explosive accumulation of wealth and no checks on it whatsoever. And that results in this extreme new form of inequality. So if you're a woman wanting to divorce, you have given up all of your property rights and your wealth to the man. And you already know that if you end up in a divorce, in a contentious divorce situation, you're going to be on the losing end of that. So yeah, trap seems apt. Yes, definitely does. I mean, I've been doing quite a few book talks um, now because this new edition of my book came out at the end of November. And there have been some young Chinese women, you know, from mainland China who ask me her advice. And I have to sadly say, look, I'm sorry, but marriage is a really bad deal for women. And if you really want to protect yourself today, if you want my honest advice, do not get married. You can avoid it. But of course, not everybody can avoid it. You have to be privileged to some extent, you know, because it is incredibly intense marriage pressure that these women are coming under, often from their own parents. And the the poorer you are, the fewer options you have. So obviously, the kinds of women who, who are able to attend a book talk of mine in America are not the least privileged. They're the most privileged. So if you are privileged enough to be able to get a college education or more and work and travel abroad, then certainly I don't want to sound extreme, but I'm basically saying marriage really is a trap in China. You cannot get out of it. Well, obviously, if you're lucky enough to have a spouse who will agree to everything that you want, if you're divorcing, then you'll be fine. But you're completely dependent on just whatever capricious thing your spouse says. If your spouse does not want to grant you a divorce, then you truly are trapped. It's exceedingly difficult to get a divorce. So why, you know, why get married then? And this is a big part of why so many women today in China don't want to get married. They're just making a rational choice. It may seem to be kind of extreme, but to me, it seems like a sensible decision on the part of a lot of these young women today in China. And that's not even talking about domestic violence as a phenomenon. Well, yes. I mean, violence 
against women basically goes completely unpunished and unmonitored in China, in spite of the government having passed an anti-domestic violence law um, that was enacted in 2016. But basically what all the research has found is that that law is simply not enforced. It's almost impossible to get a restraining order if you're the victim of domestic violence. And divorce judges simply do not take the concept of domestic violence seriously at all. It has no bearing on a judge's decision about whether or not to allow a woman to get a divorce. And the only times that extremely violent abuse is actually penalized in any way is is if there has been a huge amount of publicity. So there are some cases that are, say, videotaped, in, and then they go viral on social media in China. Um, there are a few cases of that where, for example, um, in the last couple of years, there was a group of men who just were beating up these women, just eating at a restaurant. And it was all caught on video, really shocking violence. And that video went viral. And so there was a lot of outrage over it. And so those men were given some kind of jail term, but it was all very obscure. You know, the victims were not highlighted in any way. And that is just so unusual. The vast majority of cases of violence go completely unacknowledged. And not only that, but even the official All China Women's Federation, which is the government women's agency, they're supposed to protect women. That's what their official mandate is. But whenever victims of violence come appealing, trying to seek help, women's federation officials tell them, go back to your husband, try to work it out. This is just a private matter. There is absolutely no recourse. And that is the most depressing thing of all. If you're a victim of intimate partner violence, is there is pretty much nothing you can do about it. You've written a book about the new feminist movement in China called Betraying Big Brother, and you've written articles and extensively about it. Is domestic abuse one of the top agendas or? Yes. So definitely these feminist activists in China have drawn attention to the epidemic of domestic violence. But of course, because there is shrinking space for civil society in general in China. There is just a massive increase in political repression under the new leader, Xi Jinping, who's really emerged to become just increasingly a dictator. That the feminist movement itself is highly persecuted. The activists themselves are persecuted. So it's increasingly difficult to do anything um, in terms of feminist activism. So what has become more popular as a cause of feminists online? Because basically you don't have, there's really no room for street protests or direct actions anymore. Well, just to, as an example of um, the crackdown on feminism and even Me Too activists, there is a woman who was very prominent in the Me Too movement, named Huang Xueqin, or Sophia Huang Xueqin, who was detained for two years, and nobody knew where she was. And then just a few months ago, towards the end of 2023, she was put on trial on very vague charges of subversion. But we still don't even know what the verdict is. That that's just an example of how incredibly dangerous it is. You just, I mean, who would ever have thought that just talking about sexual harassment in the journalism field, which is what this woman was doing, she was a journalist, she was disappeared for two whole years, then placed on a secret trial for subversion. That's just, there is no space for um, that kind of collective action. So what you see today in the very censored environment of the social media, it's extremely censored. Nonetheless, there is a lot of discourse about feminist topics that are 
maybe not politically described as feminist because of the government crackdown on feminism, but sexual harassment and just sexism in general. So the discussion, it tends to be young women or young LGBTQ people who are most active in discussing these kinds of issues on social media. And a lot of those people aren't even married yet. So they're not really paying as much attention to the epidemic of domestic violence. But in terms of feminist topics of discussion, they tend to be more things like, you know, how do I avoid sexual harassment or something like, well, I don't really feel like getting married. How do I stave off this marriage pressure from my parents? Or you can have an example of feminist books that don't have anything to do with China for example, this Japanese feminist sociologist, Shizuko Ueno, her books about feminism in Japan are bestsellers in China today. And that's because she is not writing about China. If you're writing about feminism in China, like my books, are not, they're not going to be widely available. Although actually my first book, Leftover Women, was translated in 2016 by a mainland Chinese publisher and lightly censored. But the new edition is certainly not going to be available. It's it's a much more repressive environment. When China was still under severe lockdown, it was called the zero COVID lockdown for the pandemic where people were virtually imprisoned in their homes. A lot of young people took to the streets holding these blank pieces of paper to protest these draconian lockdowns. And it was very striking how many young women were on the front lines of those protests. But of course, every single place where the protests took place, there were these sweeping arrests and interrogations of everybody who took part. That crackdown is still underway. And a lot of the police reportedly were asking protesters, are you feminist? Are you lesbian? So it is exceedingly dangerous to do anything like protesting openly in China. So you have to admire the uh, bravery and courage of these young women who are finding such creative ways to show their dissent and to um, bring issues to the public and the greater world, you know? Yes. Can you go to China? I am not going there unless I'm going to be invited. And mm. nobody is inviting me. Okay. So I'm not going to just go there as a tourist. It's certainly a lot more dangerous today for everybody, actually. And that goes for not just the Chinese citizens, but people visiting who are not Chinese citizens. It's also more dangerous. So there's been more cases of non-Chinese citizens being arrested and jailed even in the last couple of years. There were a couple of Canadian men who were detained for long periods and charged with various crimes, but it was clear that they weren't committing any crimes. It was really a political thing to do with China-Canada relations. An Australian citizen of Chinese ethnicity was also jailed for quite a long time. And you just see more examples of things like that. That they're clearly forms of political persecution disguised as crimes. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing all your research and scholarship in this and all your observations. It's really super interesting. It's so important for women in different parts of the world to like learn from each other. There are more parallels and similarities than we think. Yes. Thank you so much for interviewing me. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for listening to Subject to Power. You can find the show online at subjecttopower.com or subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts. I'd love to know your thoughts on these conversations. 
so please drop a note on the website or find us on social media. The best way to support the show is to rate and review Subject to Power on Apple Podcasts. It really helps other listeners find us. Subject to Power is written, hosted, and produced by me, El Kamihira. Audio engineering is done by Jason Sheasley at Abridged Audio. Cover art by B. Johnson. And music by Beware of Darkness. <laughs>